Good evening. My name is Keith Cole. I'm the executive director for the Wolf River Conservancy. Welcome to tonight's lecture as part of this year's Wolf River Restoration Series. We're very excited about sharing with you tonight's program, Farming for the Future, Regenerative Agriculture by Dr. Forbes Walker. Let me remind you, the Wolf River Restoration Series is a series of activities that began in January with our Martin Luther King Day of Service. It continued through February and March, and now we continue through uh, April celebrating Earth Day with tonight's lecture, along with a service project to be scheduled this coming Saturday, April 22nd, which is Earth Day. Uh, the service project will be held at our Epping Way segment of the Wolf River Greenway. As always, you can visit wolfriver.org to look at our activity calendar to learn about this Saturday's event, as well as all the activities that are currently uh, going on at the Wolf River Conservancy. We're also very pleased to share with you that Brother International is our overall presenting sponsor for our four-month Wolf River Restoration Series. And this coming Saturday, our event sponsor is Buckman. So we appreciate Brother International and Buckman for their generous support of the Wolf River Restoration Series this year. We also want to acknowledge all of our corporate benefactors for 2023 through the Crawford ha Howard Family Foundation, AutoZone, FedEx, Hyde Family Foundation, International Paper, Jim Karras Subaru, <laughs> Ring Container Technologies, and Savamo for all their generous ongoing support. But of course, we appreciate all the support we receive, both from corporations as well as individual donors such as yourself. And during the course of the evening, if you'd like to make a uh, secure online donation, there'll be a link provided uh, in the uh, chat uh, section. And of course, we appreciate all gifts uh, from uh, the public. Housekeeping details, we ask that you do not record tonight's program. We are actually recording it for you. If you registered for tonight's program, you'll receive a link next week that will allow you to revisit and watch this program again. It will ultimately reside in our YouTube library for the Wolf River Conservancy. Now, it's my great pleasure to present to you our speaker for tonight, Dr. Forbes Walker. Dr. Walker received a PhD in soil science from North Carolina State University in 1998. And since that time has worked as an environmental soil specialist for the University of Tennessee. As the env environmental soil specialist, he's responsible for creating or coordinating educational and research programs in Tennessee in the areas of cover crops and soil health, nutrient and manure management, the appropriate use of alternative fertilizer materials, waste utilization, nutrient cycling, and water quality. Much of his work today is related to the impact of agriculture on the environment and assessing practices that will improve agricultural product productivity without negatively impacting the environment, specifically water and air quality. He currently manages several research and extension pro projects looking at the impact of agriculture and in fact, he has done projects around the world. So we're very excited to have Dr. Walker with us tonight. Dr. Dr. Walker, welcome, and we're happy to have you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I hope everyone can see me and uh, see my slide. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, right. So the uh, topic we're going to be talking about today is farming for the future, regenerative agriculture. And uh, hopefully we will get across that this is a, it's not a new term. It's a relatively old term, but it's had uh, got some new life in it in the last few years. So let's uh, start. So this is a, a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Basically talking a little bit about what regenerative ag and there's numerous definitions out there and uh, talk about how it's talked about in the media and uh, how it's talked about in the corporate world. And then what we're doing here in Tennessee. Uh, in the area of row crop management and livestock management. And then a little bit, talk a little bit about, about kind of the next phase of uh, regenerative ag, this climate smart agriculture and some of the things that we're doing. And I've got a few slides just to end. We're looking at some brief snapshots of water quality in the uh, Wolf River. As always, you know, we'll then, um, be welcoming questions at the end. So um, hopefully these, some of these things will just stimulate some discussion. So in terms of agriculture, if you do a quick Google search, there's a lot of buzzwords out there uh, on different types of agriculture. 
I've listed some of them there, alternative, biodynamic, biointensity, organic, natural, nature-based, conservation, regenerative, climate smart. So there's lots and lots of definitions. And uh, one thing that you'll learn that these things aren't working in isolation. Many of these definitions also include a lot of practices that are quite similar. This is a slide showing a, a recent publication in our um, Soil Science Society of America publication where they looked at uh, the term sustainability and uh, looked at different um, agriculture systems that fall under the umbrella of sustainable agriculture. So you can see, you know, different columns there listed sustainable, regenerative, conservation, climate smart and organic. And on the left hand side, the uh, principles and practices, things that emphasize soil health, some of the practices keeping the soil covered, minimizing soil disturbance, maintenance of living roots year round. So you'll see uh, across a lot of these different agricultural systems, similar types of practices are being emphasized and practiced. Uh, the real thing is to um, and I'll go down there is to kind of uh, build more res resilient soils. And we do that through increasing soil carbon and soil organic matter. And uh, we'll talk about some of the work that we've been doing in this area. But uh, this is a nice summary of the some of the, uh, the, the different practices, the different agricultural systems and the, and the, uh, the common practices we find across them. I got this slide here. Just to, this is this is Forbes Walker's view of the world. We talk about uh, the evolution of sustainable agriculture in North America. So obviously, prior to European settlement, uh, the landscape was dominated by indigenous agriculture. A lot of the agriculture came in from Central America, uh, with the introduction of um, cr uh, crops like corn or maize, squash and beans. Uh, so a very low intensive type of agriculture, a lot of hunting and gathering and some growing of these uh, staple foods, maize, squash and beans. Starting in the uh, 1700s, the uh, Europeans moved in and with it, they came with their, their European style agriculture, their European style crops, as well as some of their technologies. And the plow was one of these things that they, they came across. Uh, plow is very good, works very well in the European situation. But after almost 200 years of uh, using the plow and uh, pulverizing our soil, uh, we ran into some problems in the 1930s. The Dust Bowl in the uh, Oklahoma area uh, created all sorts of horrible erosion. And that led to the development of some sort of uh, technologies to try and control erosion and uh, Ultimately, it led to the development of some of the things that we're, we're, we're commonly using here in Tennessee today. Uh, the terms that are used starting back in the 1980s, conservation agriculture was a term that started to be used. This is a term that uh, the, um, there's different definitions out there again. The, the combination of reduced or no-till systems, crop rotations, permanent soil cover. Um, in the literature and the um, and the and the public uh, and the popular press, different terms are being used starting in the 1940s. They, we talked a lot about soil tilt. This kind of was uh, looking at, you know, soil chemistry as well as soil physical properties. That was replaced in the early 70s and 80s by soil quality, which takes a little bit more understanding of the biology. And today we're really looking at a lot of things on the soil health. And we'll talk a little bit about soil health later on. Uh, regenerative agriculture, it's a, it's a term that's been around since the 80s, but really in the last few years, it's started to get a whole lot more uh, attention. And this is what we'll be talking about this evening. And uh, in the last couple of years, climate smart agriculture has really started to take off. And I would say many of the practices that we're talking about in regenerative ag are practices that we're also doing with climate smart agriculture. There's a lot of... Um, Interest in this term regenerative ag being stimulated from the media. Uh, this is just an example of a, a film that was recently um, a documentary film that usually came, came out in uh, 2020, a film narrated by Woody Harrison. It's a nice documentary. I recommend that you um, uh, look it up if you want. Uh, just given the, the understanding that uh, uh, it can be a little bit uh, um, uh, scary some of the things that they're trying to say and uh, the um, 
like all things from from Hollywood, they they like a little bit of a scare factor, and then what can we do to solve the problem? So uh, this is uh, uh, one of several films that's out there, uh, Kiss the Ground, and uh, uh, we actually recently on campus here in Knoxville had the uh, the producer of that film, who uh, doesn't actually come from an agricultural background. He comes from California. A lot of it is very ag California centric. Uh, what they do in California isn't necessarily how we practice agriculture here in Tennessee. I'm going to go to um, some of the uh, the scientific literature. There's some summaries that people have put together. This is a, uh, a, a, a paper that came out in 2020 looking at regenerative agriculture, talking about that soil is the base. This is a paper that came out of the Netherlands. And really, this gives a good summary of some of the things that we're trying to do when we we're talking about regenerative agriculture. We're trying to regenerate the soil, to re uh, improve the ecosystem, and really some of the practices that we're looking at are in enhancing and improving soil health, improving soil diversity, soil carbon, soil physical quality, uh, mixing the farming in, minimized tillage. Uh, these are all themes that we'll be re revisiting throughout the rest of this uh, talk here. Um, the term soil health, soil health is a term that was started uh, back in the uh, early 2000s. This is one of the first papers that was mentioned. This is a paper from 2000, uh, a couple of scientists in the United States Department of Agriculture. And again, look at some of the practices they're talking about. We want to promote soil health. We want to minimize soil erosion. How do we do that? We do that through this conservation tillage, protective covers, keeping the soil covered, uh, conserving and building organic matter. Uh, balancing production and using our natural resources to the best of our ability. These are many, many of the practices that we're talking about in regenerative ag. So I really want to mention, highlight this to say that this term regenerative ag that the media have grabbed onto is not, you know, the practices aren't new. They, we've been doing these uh, for many, many years. And I would argue in Tennessee, we've been doing them for the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, so there's no real definition of regenerative ag. There's a number of common themes that practitioners of the uh, of the uh, of the theme here will will promote. Uh, so this is an organization, the uh, Re USA Regenerative Agriculture Alliance, actually based in Greenville, Tennessee, of all places. And their five principles of regenerative agriculture are minimizing soil disturbance, maintaining a living root system throughout the year keeping the soil covered and integrating animal agriculture and uh, planting uh, diverse crops. So I would argue that we are already doing many of these things here in Tennessee, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So this term regenerative ag has really been um, hijacked, I would say, by the, the corporate world. And uh, one of the first corporations to hijack the, the term was, Gen, uh, was General Mills, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of these things, but you can see they're, they're talking now about six principles of uh, um, regenerative agriculture, very similar to the, uh, the definition that the uh, previous organization was talking about. The one definition that they've added is understand your context of your farm operation. And what that means to say is, what is regenerative ag in Tennessee isn't the same as regenerative ag in North Dakota, which isn't the same as regenerative ag in, in uh, California. But again, you see these other things are minimizing soil disturbance, maximizing crop diversity. We do that through crop rotations, keeping our soil covered. We do that with uh, cover crops, with crop residues or with our growing crop, maintaining living roots. We can do that with, uh, with cover crops and uh, integrating where practical uh, livestock. And sometimes that may be using uh, uh, manures and things as alternative fertilizer sources. And sometimes we're actually integrating our livestock into the production system. So it's, it's becoming a more common practice to actually graze some of our co cover crops and uh, reduce the biomass before we start planting. Uh, so this is the, the uh, definition that regenerative ag has. And many, many similar organizations have grabbed onto many of these definitions. Um, Many of my colleagues within the uh, land grant system will often say, well, we've been talking about this for a long time. Are we not in the term using the term regenerative ag, not just rebranding what we've already been doing? And the right hand side of the slide here, I've got a, uh, a screenshot I've taken from the uh, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. 
Now, they've been promoting conservation agriculture for many, many years, and you can see their definition of conservation. Minimal mechanical soil uh, disturbance, permanent soil cover, and species diversification. Those are the same things that regenerative ag has been, that uh, the uh, General Mills are being used, um, in addition to, you know, adding cover crops and animals. So uh, just a point of things, you don't, don't hear a lot of uh, discussion from the land grant universities about regenerative ag, because many of us are arguing we've already been doing that. I guess I'm a little bit different in that I've actually been talking to people about it and saying, yes, this is, uh, you know, this is what regenerative ag is. It's nothing really new. It's just we are doing stuff that we've already been doing for a long time. So I mentioned earlier on that uh, regenerative ag is one of our, um, is an old new term. It was first mentioned uh, by the, uh, described by the Rodale Institute in New Jersey, they're an organic or agriculture organization. And uh, they were talking about regenerative organic agriculture. So rather than just, you know, going ab about talking about sustainable, but what can we do with our practices that actually improve the soil? Great emphasis in this term of regenerative organic agriculture about closing nutrient loops, greater diversity, and using perennials rather than annuals. Um, first discussed, you know, by Robert Rodell, the, uh, the founder of the Institute back in the, the 80s. They were talking about seven tendencies towards uh, regenerative agriculture. And they got several white papers. And uh, I've come highlighted the uh, results of a couple of these white papers. One of them is they're suggesting in one of the, that the adoption of regenerative ag could sequester more than 100% of the current anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide. So, um, and there's a figure there at the bottom suggesting that uh, yes, uh, based on some of their numbers, you know, we can more than easily sequester all the carbon that is being produced by human activity by do, changing the way we do agriculture. And, and uh, but we'd have to do it on a global scale rather than just on a state by state or a regional scale. Um, <clears throat> also draw our attention to the work of another um, individual, Alan Savory. Uh, Alan Savory is, is originally from Zimbabwe. He's been basically a rangeland ecologist. Uh, he's been working in the 50s and 60s, and um, he's um, quite well known in his area when he basically says that uh, overgrazing is not due to uh, uh, the um, due to the animals, it's due to the way we're managing our animals. And those of you who are interested, I would encourage you to uh, Google him. And he's got a, a TED talk he gave in 2013. And there's several million views, and that gives a good in background of some of the things that he's been doing. But they are very much now on board with the uh, regeneration of grasslands. And uh, the last bullet there shows a uh, verification program where they're trying to connect buyers uh, with regenerative farmers. So if I'm looking for uh, produce that is or commodities that produce in a certain way, regenerative agriculture. These are how they sound. So they have a, a program that they, they are, are promoting that. Going back to the literature, how did the um, this term regenerative agriculture suddenly get so much attention in recent years? And this is a paper that came out in 2021. Ken Giller and his colleagues from Fakeningen University in Holland looked at different Google searches and things like that. And you can see uh, the solid bars show where this, this term appears in the in the literature. And you can say, very much in the, the 80s, it was the uh, Rodale Institute that was the one that was talking about it. Kind of, uh, no one really start, talked about it until two or three years ago when uh, organizations like the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife, Greenpeace, and different uh, uh, um, in, industrial groups started saying, yeah, we're gonna be looking at regenerative ag. So that's just to show where this term has suddenly appeared and got a lot more attention than it did in the past. So this is a, a quick summary of uh, the uh, things that have happened in the last uh, few years, the last five years uh, with industry, with corporations. And so starting back in November of 2017, Danone, <clears throat> it's a French dairy products company, basically made a, a statement that by 2025, all the products that they produce in France um, are going to be produced using regenerative agricultural practices. 
We first heard about uh, regenerative ag in uh, <clears throat> the United States with General Mills, where they, in 2019, uh, said uh, a million acres of farmland by 2030. And so that was a kind of uh, call to arms by, OK, um, people were asking the question, what is regenerative ag and uh, how can farmers, you know, benefit and, and benefit from this thing? And uh, what exactly is it? Uh, we then hit the. Um, the, the, uh, the, the the COVID pandemic, um, this is where I think a lot of the sustainability offices and different corporates, corporations started to put their heads together. And so uh, McCain Foods <clears throat> back in June of 2020 said 100 percent of its potato acreage was going to be uh, uh, regenerative ag by 2030. Uh, remember, one of the uh, main practices of, of regenerative ag is reduced tillage. Potatoes and re reduced tillage aren't usually used in the same uh, sentence with me, so I wonder how they're going to achieve that. Um, Cargill. So remember, General Mills said back in uh, 2019 that they're going to do a million acres. Cargill, it's like a, it's like a, a game of poker. They said we'll raise you to a hundred to, to 10 million acres uh, by 2030, and they came up with this announcement in 2020 in September. Uh, Walmart, you know, came up with a similar statement uh, a, a week or so later saying uh, that we, you know, source product from 50 million acres, 100 million square miles. And so we're going to be demanding that uh, our practitioners or our suppliers use regenerative ag uh, by 2030. Uh, PepsiCo um, made the statement uh, towards the end of 2021, 7 million acres. So you can see there's been a progression of a lot of these very um, broad and uh, statements by the the industry folks as to this is what we're going to be doing. And the livestock, I haven't really mentioned the livestock sector, they were a little bit later to the game than the um, other corporations, but uh, U.S. Dairy in the middle of, towards the end of 2020 said they're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. G JBS Foods, which is the global leader in beef and poultry production, uh, said they're going to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. Uh, Tyson Foods, which is the number one U.S. Uh, meat and uh, poultry operation, primarily beef and swine and poultry. Uh, they made this announcement uh, middle of 2021. And then the Cattlemen's Association uh, made a, a carbon neutrality statement by 2040 at the end of 2021. So. A lot of these statements, they've given themselves a, a decade or a couple of decades to achieve these goals. The challenge that we have as scientists have is how are we going to do that? And uh, where are we currently standing? I throw this picture up here to say this is how bad agriculture was doing stuff in the past in, uh, in Tennessee. These are some uh, pictures that I got from the uh, Tennessee State Library and Archives. And uh, you can see, you know, early uh, European settlers came with their plows and started plowing up land in uh, East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, and then finally West Tennessee. And you can see how bad it got in uh, West Tennessee by the 1930s. Uh, the reason for this is not only the fact that you're, you're inverting the soil with these very efficient plowing, plow systems, but also the nature of the soils, the parent materials of these soils make them very, very erosive. And so that's why you end up with these horrible moonscapes. Um, picture on the bottom right there is a silted stream near Jackson, uh, 1939. And uh, you speak to a lot of the old timers in West Tennessee and they will say, yeah, growing up, uh, when we were growing up and everyone was plowing, uh, we didn't realize that uh, you could actually see the bottom. You know, we, the, the rivers were always muddy and full of sediment. Uh, those things have changed and in the in the last generation. So uh, uh, there's another picture here of the uh, Monroe County, 1948, 1947, with the mule uh, trying to have a nice clean uh, seed bed prepared. So controlling erosion. So erosion was really, really a very bad thing in Tennessee as that previous um, slide shows. So starting with the, you know, the, the 1930s, the Bud Dust Bowl was really a wake up call for the United States. So what can we do to have effective control of erosion, while, but still enabling us to keep on doing these intensive op, op, cropping systems? Some of the early suggestions was, well, get out of row crop production and get into pasture systems. There's gonna be less erosion there. 
that's okay for some folks, but for most people, it didn't work and uh, you couldn't maintain the productivity. There's also some you know, economic reasons for erosion control. Ideally, we want systems that really require little or no maintenance. Uh, the bottom slide there shows uh, some of the early uh, ideas were to put terraces out there. And yet terraces were great, but they were expensive and they needed to be maintained. Other suggestions were contour plowing. So rather than plowing up and down the field, let's plow on the contours and reduce our erosion rates. Um, so controlling erosion from the 30s and 40s, different people tried different things. The adoption rates were okay, but it really didn't control the, um, the, the serious problem. So where are we today? <clears throat> so in Tennessee, we are, uh, we are a no-till state. And we'll talk a little bit about how we came to be that, but we are the uh, the state with the highest rates of no-till adoption, I would say, in the world. We are about 90% adoption of no-till. And this is a typical kind of system that we have. This is um, some uh, photographs from some of the plots that I work with at Milan in West Tennessee. So typically, after we um, harvest our, our corn crop, we'll put in a, a wheat crop uh, to grow over the winter. And uh, that wheat crop will typically grow over the winter. And then we will typically, uh, before we plant our next crop, we will uh, uh, terminate it, usually with a herbicide, though we don't have to use a herbicide. And then rather than inverting the soil 100%, we just make a very small slit in the ground uh, that introduces the seed. And uh, then you can see on the bottom left here, the crop is emerging, uh, residue still from the uh, the uh, previous season's growth and uh, that re massive reductions in soil erosion. Rule of thumb, if we can maintain at least 30% residue cover on the soil, we're going to reduce our erosion rates by 80%. So we're well over 30% there on that field. So we've dramatically reduced our erosion rates. Um, this is a, a study that came <clears throat> out of the uh, 2017 census. This is an organization, the Soil Health Institute based in North Carolina. And here's a couple of uh, graphs, that, a couple of maps that they've sent you. You can see Tennessee, we are the number one adopter of no-till in the nation in terms of um, um, percent adoption. Over 75% is actually closer to 90%. Uh, compare that with some of our uh, uh, folks from the Western states. I, I always get a kick out of people from California coming to us in Tennessee and telling us how to do no-till when they're at less than 15% adoption and we're at 90% adoption. Uh, do we have rooms for improvement? Absolutely, we do. Our cover crop adoption is still around 10 to 15%. And uh, so we do still have room for improvement. But uh, in terms of no-till adoption, we are the uh, global leaders. Um, so this is some uh, recent kind of uh, statistics on the adoption of no-till. I would say, you know, prior to... Um, 1990, the easier systems to work on are what we call the high residue systems. So systems where we harvest the grain and leave a lot of the residue on the surface were easy to, to, to work. That, that was a lot of that was the, the corn systems. You can see the uh, early adoption of the uh, of the in the, the green thing here of the maize or corn systems compared with some of these other systems. Uh, we don't really leave a whole lot of residue behind after we've harvested soybeans or cotton. So these are a little bit more challenging to develop systems. In the mid nineties, we started to have a lot of herbicides uh, that we could actually use over the top and uh, a lot of GMO uh, with, with herbicide resistant traits in there enabled us to have some dramatic uptake. And you can see these Traits were all introduced in the mid 90s, and so some dramatic uh, in increases. So, this is a report from uh, 2018. Unfortunately, no one's done any reports since then, but you can see that soybeans uh, across the state of Tennessee in 2018 we had 85% adoption of no till, followed by cotton with 80% and uh, corn at 75%. So, some really quite impressive numbers there uh, with adoption of no till. How did we do it? Well, it's really it was a you know a few stubborn farmers that said we couldn't keep on doing business as usual. We, things need to change. Uh, it was a wasn't an uncommon practice for farmers to plow their fields after the the harvest, and then erosion took place over the um, the winter months. And it wasn't uncommon for the first 
operation that farmers would have to do before they could plow for the next season would be to take um, um, some blades in and, and fill in all the gullies that are emerged over the, uh, the winter months. But the big um, improvements in technology were good weed control systems and planting equipment. So if you want to do no-till, you've got to have a way of controlling weeds. Weeds are typically controlled with tillage in most of the world. Uh, and if we're controlling the weeds, the next thing is how do we get that seed in the ground and get good soil to seed contact? So this was a not a, a, a job that just you know the university did. We did it in collaboration with lots and lots of partners, especially our friends at the United States Department of Agriculture and the NRCS. Um, back in Tennessee, we actually have our, our, our experiment station that we, um, back in 1983, was converted 100% to no-till and still today it has not had a, a plowed in the, in the ground since 1983. Uh, this is a globally important event. We had a field day. Attendance peaked in 1995 with over 11,000 at this field day. Uh, we still are having these field days. We had our last one last year, still attracted um, 1,200 people. Nothing like the 11,000 that, that happened, but uh, uh, we do have a, one of the other things that we've done is 2020, we went virtual. A lot of our presentations are all on there. And it's amazing when we uh, do our presentations virtually. Uh, I, I The last time we did it in 2020, I remember I had people call me from Japan. I had people call me from New Zealand. So there's a lot of people look at these websites to see what we're talking about. This is a classic picture from the 1980s here. This is our, again at our Milan research station. What we've got here is we've got cotton. Uh, in no-till system on the left and cotton in the no-till system on the um and in a tillage system on the right and we've got some irrigation overhead and you can just by seeing the color of the water from the no-till side versus the color of the water from the tilled side dramatic dramatic reductions in erosion just through these no-till this is a kind of classic picture from the 1980s um, we've done lots of work since then talk a little bit about reduction in soil erosion rates the, um, as a soil science, we, we use a, an equation called the revised universal soil equation. I won't bore you with it, but this is something that USDA uses. Uh, there's different factors in there. R is the rainfall factor. L and S is the slope angle and the length of the slope. K is the erosivity of the soil. And the C is the cover factor. And the big thing is this use not a whole lot in terms of erosion that you can do to control the rainfall. There's not a whole lot you can do to control the length of the slope or the angle of the slope or the erosivity of the soil, but you can keep that soil covered. If you keep that soil covered, then you can dramatically reduce erosion rates. So this is just some examples of uh, some outputs from that particular equation. So we've got corn uh, produced uh, in an, uh, with, with a plowed system. 64 tons of soil loss per acre per year in this particular soil in Gibson County. Uh, remember corn has got a little bit of residue, so it's slightly lower erosion rates compared with the systems that have very little residue, the soil and the cotton, you can see cotton. 100 tons of soil loss per acre per year. Imagine doing that for 200 years and how much soil you've lost. So. When we change from a plowed system, a no-till system, dramatic reductions in soil erosion. Uh, corn goes from 64 tonnes to uh, less than two tonnes. Soybeans and cotton, still dramatic reductions, but not as dramatic as um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the corn system. Can we do better? Yes, we can do better. If we add a cover crop behind the, uh, the, the, uh, the harvest of the main crop, we can reduce our corn erosion rates to less than one tonne our soy to less than four tons and our cotton to less than five tons. Extrapolate that over the whole region, there's some fairly significant reductions in erosion. And if you're reducing your erosion, you're obviously building up your soil um, and maintaining that soil, improving the soil structure and, and maintaining the health and the quality of that soil. This is something that we do at the University of Tennessee. You know, why are farmers in Tennessee adopting no-till to such an extent. And really what it is, is obviously the dramatic uh, reductions in erosion. That's partly because of our very erosive soils in West Tennessee. The other thing is the economics. If you're driving across the field fewer times in a no-till system with smaller pieces of a machinery, you've obviously got much less machinery and labor costs. 
And this is an example of some field crop budgets that we put out every year for our, our growers. This is from our Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. And the return on expenses from a no-till system is you know, $122 an acre compared with only 94. Now, other benefits we do see, you know, reductions in erosion, increases in soil carbon, improvements in aggregate stability, changes in soil biology. These are all things uh, related to uh, what people in the regenerative ag world are interested in seeing. Uh, I can, uh, this is just some summary work. This is basically the summary of about 40 years worth of research in this area. But with cover crops, we have demonstrated increases in soil carbon. Carbon is the driver in increasing the soil health and driver in some of these uh, regenerative ag systems. We see an increase in the uh, wet aggregate stability. This is how, how stable are the soil aggregates uh, to uh, being uh, pulverized by, uh, by raindrops. If we've got leguminous crops in the mix, uh, we see a lot of more nitrogen going into the system. We see better infiltrations um, in cover crop systems, in till systems and in no-till cotton. We see great uh, benefits in suppressing weeds and all sorts of uh, benefits in the changes in the soil biology, as well as improving yields under extreme weather. So I mentioned these are some of the uh, soil health practices. These are also the regenerative ag practices. So they're reducing the, the, the tillage, the cover crops, the nutrient management. And over time, we see dramatic increases in soil carbon, improvements in soil physical properties, soil moisture. We build out soil resilience to better manage our weather extremes. And we believe there are some also potential future economic benefits. We're talking about future carbon credits. So farmers may get uh, be able to sell some of the carbon that they've sequestered in their soil to uh, entities that are uh, needing to, uh, to buy these credits. We briefly talk about regenerative uh, agriculture and the livestock thing. Most of our work has been focused on the row crop stuff. But if you look at the uh, those definitions of regenerative ag, Reduced tillage, permanent soil cover, crop rotations, living roots, and integration with livestock. I think when we have our grazing systems here in Tennessee, we basically, we're, we're not planting our, our grass every year. We've got that grass acting as a permanent soil cover. We've got living roots. We've got livestock in the system. One thing we don't really have is crop rotations, although we can diversify the crops by uh, interceding with different leguminous crops and other crops. So this is uh, regenerative livestock in uh, livestock production in, in Tennessee. Um, we've got a lot of focus these days on our grazing systems in Tennessee. And really what it is, is because of the number of animals we've got. I didn't throw up the numbers for our corn, soy and cotton acres, uh, but you can see from this, this is a, a, a 2022 state agricultural overview. In terms of cattle, we've got over a million and a half cattle. And uh, if you think about each cow that we've got needs about one to two acres of, uh, of grass in order to, uh, uh, to thrive. So very, very large footprint. Um, you mentioned some of the other animals, the, the goats, the sheep and the, the milk goats. Not as much of a thing, but uh, um, the other um, animal that we are particularly interested in is horses. We've got a very large horse population. I had difficulty coming up with recent uh, estimates of horse populations in Tennessee, but uh, uh, we've, this is a, some data from the 2007 census where we had over 200,000 horses. Now, cattle need one to two acres per cow. Horses need three to five acres to be in a really sustainable system. And it's not often that we do see that amount of land for horses, but that's just to show you the footprint that we've got for um, our pasture systems here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of our um, our pasture systems. So we are, are a dominant, um, our, our, our dominant pasture, our um, forage in, in the southeast is tall fescue. It's a cool season grass. And you can see this is the extent of where we th uh, think the fescue belt is. Uh, one of the challenges with understanding what fescue is, it's a cool season grass. You see this graph at the bottom. So basically it does really well in the springtime. In the summer months, it goes dormant. And then in the, uh, uh, once it starts to cool down and towards the end of the year, it, it starts to uh, become, uh, um, grow again. 
one of the things that we're trying to do with our grazing systems is complement this grazing system with the cool season grasses, the, the tall fescues, with warm season grasses that do really well in the summer months. So the idea is we have some fields with cool season grasses uh, for the cooler times of the year. Uh, once they gets too hot for those grasses to grow, we move animals onto these uh, warm season grasses. Now, both exotic things like Bermuda grass or crab grass is a warm season grass. Or uh, we're doing a lot of work with native warm season grasses, and I'll explain a little bit why natives are uh, really important. So one of the big things about native warm season grasses is A, they are natives to the United States. They are the grasses under which a lot of the, um, um, the really great soils from the Midwest were, were, were formed. But the big thing is they, how deep the roots go. So these roots are very, very deep. Uh, you can see this is a, an example of a switchgrass plant, 14 feet. And so these plants are very, very tolerant of dry spells uh, because they can access moisture down 14, 15 feet. They're also very, very tolerant of floods. So if you have a large rain event, you've got such great infiltration rates uh, that uh, we don't typically get to see any flooding because of the really high infiltration rates compared with the lower infiltration rates uh, with some of our shallower rooted um, cool season plants. Uh, I've got this slide here just to talk about, you know, why we uh, put this emphasis on these, these native warm season grasses. Uh, these are grasses that basically co-evolve with our large bovines. Um, so if you think about the Great Plains, uh, and the, there's a picture of a mollusol. These are these dark, um, high organic matter soils that we've got from the Midwest. This is why the Midwest is so productive, because these soils were all formed under grasses in combination with the grazing activities of these uh, large um, bovines, the bison and the buffalo. And uh, because these grasses co-evolved with these animals, they actually do much better when they are grazed. And uh, one of the other things is a uh, the, the diversity in these systems is immense compared with some of the monocultures that we like to, to focus on here in the uh, the tall fescue uh, belt and examples here of some of the um, four to 500 species of healthy grassland. And that obviously helps benefit the animals because of they've got the much greater uh, nutritional value there. And um, I'll also mention this is some, uh, I've gone into some of the scientific literature I used, uh, this is work out of the Serengeti in East Africa. Uh, this is, believe it or not, way back in 1976, where they're looking at, you know, what happens when a, a million wildebeest and 600,000 Thompson's gazelle and 200,000 zebra graze. And they see that the, after four days, the biomass was reduced in the uh, grass systems in the Serengeti by 85%. Uh, 28 later, year, days later, they came back to where they'd been grazed. And in the grazed area, they were producing uh, 2.6 grams per square meter per day, whereas in the ungrazed areas, uh, the, uh, they were actually losing uh, production. So basically what this says is that these grasses need to be grazed and we need to, uh, and by doing that, we're, we're increasing nutrient turnover and doing all sorts of great things in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the soil health and, and the soil quality. Um, regenerative ag, I'll just, briefly touch on some of the things that we're doing at the, the University of Tennessee. We do have a team together. We've got a website, which is, uh, we, we put up a, uh, last year, we haven't really done a whole lot with it, but uh, we do have um, this website that's in very early development stage, but uh, you know, we've got an outline of the team that are involved and uh, some of the projects that we are got ongoing. Um, I'm now gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about, and we've talked about regenerative ag, and these core practices, reduced tillage, um, permanent you know, roots, crop rotations, and uh, integrating with, with, with livestock systems. Talk a little bit about where we're going now in agriculture. And it's not just regenerative ag, it's paying a lot of attention on climate change and what climate change is, is doing. And I, I, uh, I've got this slide up there from a former colleague of mine, Tom Wilbanks from Oak Ridge National Lab. This is a talk he gave back in 2014. And he says, basically, see, he's a climate modeler, climate scientist. And his predictions are, we're gonna see more higher temperatures in our region. We're gonna see severe and more frequent storms. Sea level rise is gonna be a big problem. 
And we're going to see these more variable precipitation patterns, more floods and more droughts. And uh, we're going to see all sorts of changes in the, the, the demographics, economics, and the environmental patterns of the thing. I think what Tom was mentioning in 2040, a lot of these things have come to pass, and we're hearing more and more about it. You only have to look at some of the extreme weather events we've had in recent years, the uh, the floods, the uh, flood in Waverley a couple of years ago, the uh, uh, the, the big storms that we had in 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 um, Nashville, uh, you know, a few years ago as well. Um, this is uh, some data from the uh, NOAA, the National Center for Environmental Information, looking at the cost of these things by not addressing some of these climate um, disasters. And this is uh, the years 1980 to present. You can see uh, almost eight of these billion dollar events uh, per year from 80 to, pre to present. If you move that forward to the last three years, 2020, 2021, and 2022, there's 20. So there's been a th almost a threefold increase in these billion dollar events. And these are uh, all corrected for, you know, current day dollar values. It's not a billion dollars in 1980 versus a billion dollars today. These are all being normalized. Um, looking at some of the other things, this is again from their site. In Tennessee, what kind of uh, weather events have we had, major weather events? So we've had in this period, 1980 to, to uh, 22, so it was over 40 years, we've had 14 droughts, 14 major weather, winter storms, 52 severe storms, tropical cyclones, freeze, et cetera, et cetera. So we've had lots and lots of these billion dollar events in, in Tennessee. The um, United States Department of Agriculture uh, with this current administration is really pushing climate change adaptation. And many of these practices, if you recall back to the, one of these earlier slides I showed, um, are the same practices that we're talking about in regenerative ag. Uh, they called for a, uh, they've got a action plan that they came up with in August of 2021. And uh, they came up with some uh, uh, requests of some very large proposals, some pilot projects using climate smart practices. Uh, they actually funded $2.8 billion of them. And uh, uh, some of the things that we're looking at is, you know, in this era of climate change, we're going to see decreased agricultural productivity. What can we do to uh, maintain crop and livestock production? You know, uh, what can we do to reverse reduce soil quality and the pests and diseases? How can we, um, you know, manage any threats to water quality and quantity? And uh, understanding that a lot of these impacts are going to be on more vulnerable rural communities. And uh, how can we uh, build our infrastructure to, to handle some of these things? When we talk about climate smart agriculture, so we talked about, you know, um, uh, regenerative agriculture, but really what we're looking at is uh, not only are we looking at reducing erosion, improving soil health, improving soil quality, uh, uh, but also what can we do to actually build soil resilience? What can we do to further sequester carbon? And what can we do to actually mitigate some of these greenhouse gases? So. Uh, can we take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil? Uh, what about methane and nitrous oxide? Um, basically, methane is going to be uh, coming from any, many of our flooded systems. So rice production is a big contributor there. <laughs> For us in Tennessee, uh, a lot of the uh, the bovines, of the beef and the dairy um, herds, they produce a lot of um, methane. They expel a lot in their... Um, what can we do? And there's a, a number of things that we can do in terms of feed management and the way we feed our animals. Nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas. And basically, it appears any, anywhere where we use nitrogen fertilizer, we're going to see more and more um, uh, nitrous oxide. So what can we do to mitigate against these things? Um, I will mention that of these grants that were, um, you know, they asked for back in 2021, we were fortunate enough last year uh, to be one of the people that were um, awarded one of these grants. We are got a, a focused primarily on grasslands in the Southeast. It's a $30 million grant. Uh, we've got lots and lots of partners. These are the states that we're going to be involved with, some of the commercial entities, some of the practices that we're looking at. So uh, native using introducing native grasses into the system, these regenerative grazing practices, so mimicking much more uh, the way nature intended grasses and animals, these large animals, to 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 uh, to, to be grazed. Looking at different uh, nitrogen sources, uh, different soil amendments, 
Uh, the idea being we want to improve our soil carbon storage, reduce the emissions and maintain operational profitability and resilience. So this is a, a, a grant that was, we said we got funded, we almost got the contract in place and we'll be, uh, we'll have our work cut out working in Alabama, Arkansas, Indiana, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, South Carolina and Virginia. Uh, these are some of the things that they were going to be planning to do is looking at what, how do we, what, what, what sequesters more carbon than we currently are doing? How can we improve our nitrogen management? Uh, what are the different, uh, you know, with the different systems that we've got in place? What is uh, net sources of carbon and what are net sinks of carbon? Uh, we've got different models that we'll be testing and uh, we'll be doing a lot of work in the outreach and um, thing with, with stakeholders and farmers across the, this, the, the, uh, across the region. Last couple of slides, I'm just going to quickly touch on uh, some of the, uh, the the work that you're doing in the Wolf River. This is a uh, a map I pulled off um, from your um, website of the um, of the Wolf River. You know, so obviously starting in Memphis, going all the way uh, over into uh, to Mississippi. Um, this is a um, uh, it's kind of really important. You've obviously got a lot of agricultural lands, so the big question is, you know. Uh, how good a job are is agriculture doing in these areas where agriculture is not doing a good job what do we need to do to fix it uh, this is a report that uh, the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation TDEC put together back in 2005 it's part of a watershed quality management plan fortunately they just include the Tennessee side so we don't have anything on the uh, the Mississippi side but you can see where they, back in 2005, where they estimated the uh, streams were not fully supporting their intended use and uh, where they were partially supporting and where they were uh, fully supporting. So the blue lines are, is the, is, you know, where things are doing a good job. Uh, the uh, light green colors where we can do, a, we can do things better. And uh, the red is we need to do quite a bit of work. And this is where our focal areas need to be. Uh, another source of information that I got is, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but every uh, few years, the state has to come up with what they call a 303D list. This is the list of impaired streams, and they've got to list the impairments. So I just pulled up the 2020 uh, list of impairments from the Wolf River, and out of um, uh, almost uh, 1,500 miles that they had actually uh, assessed, uh, these are the uh, sources of the impairments. So channelization, 118 miles, contaminated sediment, sediments. But uh, interesting to say, yes, of that, you know, 1,500 miles, uh, just under 70 miles was crop production. And a lot of that is, uh, you know, runoff coming. So, you know, are there things that we can do better? Absolutely, there are things we can do better. Yes, I said we're primarily no-till, but the introduction of cover crops is going to do a, a great thing there. Grazing. And uh, obviously we need there's some work in some of the areas that we can, can, can work on there. And then the largest part of the impairments listed there is the uh, mun municipalities. And I'll end with one slide here. This is a slide that uh, I am, um, Holly, we were cleaning out our basement in our building and someone came up with this old black and white photograph from 1938. And uh, it's uh, on the back of the, uh, Photograph, you can see all the uh, extension type people there, and it's a, uh, so it's a it says cover crop tour, April 21st, 1938. Uh, so we've been talking about this for a very, very long time. You remember, cover crops are one of the uh, cornerstones of the uh, regenerative ag things in terms of keeping that permanent soil cover. Um, in terms of where are we in Tennessee with the regenerative ag, I would argue that. Uh, we are one of the highest um, adopters of regenerative ag systems in, 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 the, in the world, in the nation especially, given that most of our, so we're 90% adoption of our, uh, of, of, of no-till. Um, when we look at crop rotations, everyone grows a crop in a rotation. Typically it's a corn, wheat, soybean rotation. Uh, we've got residues or cover crops in the system. So we're keeping that soil permanently covered. And uh, where we have access to uh, animal manures and uh, poultry litter, we have about 200,000 tons of poultry litter that's produced annually in Tennessee. We are putting that back onto our crop ground. So with that, I think I will um, end my discussion here.
I'm right at uh, 55 minutes or 50 minutes. So I would okay. invite you for any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wal uh, Dr. Walker. That was just a wonderful presentation. And we have a couple of questions and I have a couple as well. And for those of you listening out there, please uh, use the Q&A feature and get your questions up if you have any. Um, here's the first question. Uh, you may have addressed this already. Are there reduced erosion and increased carbon benefits to establishing a field buffer of native warm season grasses along drainage areas and roadways? around row crop agriculture? Absolutely. So I, I've been involved in, in East Tennessee in several fairly large watershed scale projects. And that was one of the things that, you know, we, we emphasize, you know, I do not want to see any bare soil. So I want to see the soil covered at all times throughout the whole growing season. And so, yes, often the um, edge of field is, is, a, is, a, is a big problem area, especially in pasture type systems. Or often we have trees along the edge of the field, so we got shading of those things. So, yes, I anywhere where we've got um, deeper rooted perennial grasses is doing a great job of carbon sequestration. Um, how much carbon sequestration we don't really know. Typically, as soil scientists, we focused on the top six inches. We really, when we go down fifteen feet, we really haven't been finding out how much carbon we've got down there, but. With these native grasses, the uh, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian gamma, in Indian grass, Eastern gamma grass, switchgrass, great potential for um, sequestration at depth. So yes, I would encourage you know field borders. The other thing about field borders is it's really important that the the, the uh, you know basically the, anything that's coming off the landscape, uh, we're, we're going to slow down the movement of any sediments. And uh, by doing that, they, the, some of the sediments will drop out into that field border. Uh, the other thing we really want to emphasize with these field borders is that we've got sheet flow going across that field uh, border and not any, uh, you know, um, concentrated flow pathways that would basically negate the whole use of the, of the, of the field border. Mm -hmm. Hopefully okay. that asked the question. Uh, that was great. Okay, here's another really good question. Should we be concerned about prime farmland that both sequesters carbon and grows needed crops being converted to solar arrays and other development threats? Yes, this is, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so this is one of the things that we are, this is one of the new projects that we're starting to do. So we've got, uh, obviously the uh, Ford folks are moving into uh, West Tennessee they got this high demand for uh, green energy. TVA is finally waking up to the uh, the fact that we need to supply this green energy. But some of the numbers I've had is, you know, just to supply the green energy needs for um, the Ford operation, we're looking at, you know, seven to 10,000 acres. Wow. And yes, it's a big concern taking prime agricultural land out of production. Um, I've got some concerns also, if you've got, you know, a, a very large farm, with solar panels, what do we do when we get that three inch rain event and uh, these impermeable surfaces, the runoff, where's that going to go? So there's uh, lots of concern. But um, having said that, we there are a group of us working on this area and uh, we're actually working with folks at the state level in Nashville about that. So it's, it's on our radar screen and you're right to be concerned about it. But uh, hopefully we'll we'll come up with some solutions. Yeah, and I've heard that there is some effort for integ integrating in agriculture with solar arrays. Yeah, so that there's been there's been some suggestions about you know what do you do under the solar panels? So some people are suggesting, well, we can graze sheep, but yeah, there's only so many sheep that we can graze. And then the other issue is anytime you've got sheep, you've got you know compaction with their hoofs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Other people are suggesting maybe we could grow some leafy green vegetables, but again, you know we're not going to be growing 7,000 acres of leafy green vegetables. And uh, <laughs> other people are even talking about, you know, can we grow things like soybeans? Up? We raise them up. So lots and lots of crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. Being with a solution. Very interesting. Um, here's a question that, oh, here's, here's one that came in. But in the meantime, um, I am wondering, I keep hearing the term agroecology, and I'm wondering if that is that the same thing as regenerative agriculture or? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. Yes, uh, agroecology is a lot of it is looking at, uh, you know, e ecological principles and finding out what's what's going on and applying that to agriculture. And 
I think we're we are already doing that with some of our, you know, our native warm season grasses, which historically we haven't grazed, but uh, my colleague Pat Kaiser in the last 10 or 15 years has demonstrated, yes, this is how you grow these things in our in our state. And yes, they do have a, a great fit in terms of maintaining animal product productivity over the hot summer months. And yes, they've got these additional benefits of additional carbon sequestration, as well as uh, flood mitigation, as well as being drought tolerant. Mm -hmm. And perhaps uh, encouraging pollinating insects, that kind of thing, maybe. In encouraging pollinators things. I, I mean, it's, it's also, I mean, a lot of the, uh, uh, I know a lot of the big, you know, chemical companies had in the past had uh, got a lot of bad press for all these nasty chemicals that they're marketing that are going around and, you know, poisoning the environment. But there's a lot, a lot of, of work being done on uh, developing biological products uh, that are much more, you know, environmentally friendly. I'm not convinced that we're actually there with many of these biological products. Yes, there are, the, the potential is there. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I think we're already we're we're learning from our mistakes in the past, and I think we're a lot smarter in the way we do things. Thanks. Okay, here's a question. Perhaps this is not applicable to this conversation, but are these native grasses or plantings that should be applied, or maybe I'm not sure I understand this, but are maybe she means maybe are there native grasses or plantings that should be applied in urban settings to prevent runoff as well? Or is there a selection of alternatives? I mean, abso absolutely. So, um, I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges is with these native grasses is, you know, everyone likes, well, a lot of people like nice mowed lawns and things like that. So mm -hmm. getting people to sort of accept what looks like a, a wild uh, mess is, uh, is a little bit of a, a thing. But, Yes, there are many cases where these native grasses would do great um, in turn. And one of the things that we've been working in some of the urban areas is to um, produce these kind of swales. So basically catchment basins to uh, intercept the runoff so it doesn't go directly to the river. We're actually just going to be absorbed in there. And uh, these native grasses, one of the other great benefits of them is they are bunch grasses. Uh, so they're great for, um, you know, wildlife. It's not like it's... You know the uh, little the little bunny rabbits and the you know birds and things can 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 uh, run between the things so they're great you know sources of, for environmental thing. The the issue then is how do you actually manage these grasses and uh, some of these grasses you know we can graze them. Uh, a lot of them are actually um, in in natural environments are managed through fire and those are things. So there's lots of discussions that we can can have on these things. But absolutely, I think there's a great role for them in um, some of the um, urban settings um, to uh, reduce the amount of mowing that mowing and blowing and fertilizing that people have to do, but also intercepting some of the runoff and, uh, you know, intercepting nutrients and sediments and also reducing some aesthetics as well, as well as wildlife and pollinator benefits. Absolutely. Um, one of your earlier slides, uh, Dr. Walker, had a, a graphic showing the no-till acreage in different states and Tennessee was very high, but down here in Memphis, we're right next to Mississippi and Arkansas. And I noticed that their no-till acreage is quite low in comparison. And I'm wondering why and what is the incentive for, for farmers to adopt, to go a different way, to adopt no-till? Well, it's obviously because the University of Tennessee is doing a much better job than the University of Arkansas and Mississippi. Now, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. Partly it is to do with the cropping systems that they've got. So, I mean, you go across the, uh, the bridge in Memphis and the first thing you come across is a, is, a, is a rice field. Do we have any rice fields in Tennessee? I don't I've never understood why we don't. But so rice, you know, that's that's what goes on in, in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, the um, other thing is, I mean, our. The soils that we've got in West Tennessee are particularly unforgiving for tillage. These are these lust derived, so they're derived from wind blown materials. So they're very fertile, but very, very erosive. You saw some of these high erosion rates, but um, what incentives are there for farmers? So USDA and NRCS have a number of incentive programs. And uh, starting back in the, the 1980s, uh, one of the things that NRCS focused on is you guys, you know, if you want government um, cost share programs to help support your operation, 
uh, you've got to really control erosion, especially on these highly erodible lands. Uh, so NRCS has this definition of what highly erodible land is and the kind of practices. And this is where a lot of Tennessee was classified as highly erodible land because of this, the, the erosivity of our soils. And uh, that's where, you know, farmers really, uh, you know, had to, you know, well, they, and then once once they adopted these practices that they could see, yes, these these practices are are cheaper for us to put in place. And in the long term, we're actually, um, um, you know, seeing improvements in soil productivity. And when we get a dry spell, we see improvements in yield. Okay. So yield is also improved with the... Uh... Oh yeah, yield yield is absolutely so. What we what we do because we're not disturbing the soil, we develop nice soil structure, which means that when we do have these large rainfall events, the, the water goes into the soil profile rather than running off, and uh, if and it'll go in be stored in the soil profile. So when we do have dry spells in our summer months, which is is a common thing, uh, we um, see yield benefits to that. Um, but over time, because we're not disturbing, every time we till our soil, we release a lot of uh, carbon into the uh, an organic matter into the atmosphere because we're not doing that we will gradually increase our soil organic matter content and it'll take us 30 years to get from you know less than one percent organic matter to three three and a half percent but some dramatic changes in soil chemical and soil physical properties because of that great um uh someone would like you to explain once more why west tennessee soil is so erodible so the soils in West Tennessee are what are called LUS soils, L-O-E-S-S. -S, and they were these they were deposited tens of thousands of years ago, basically from windblown things. So stuff that came up from the and uh, so some of these LUS deposits are many, many uh, feet thick. And uh, but there it's anyone that's driven around West Tennessee in the uh, in the summer months, you know, if you're on any dirt roads, your car gets coated in a talcum powder like material that's these lusts these silt loam materials that are, are are very very erosive so it's basically the the nature of the parent material that we have um you know whereas in middle and east tennessee which limestone is our parent material it's these lust materials that are um, which is why we see all the row crop production is in west tennessee because these lust materials are very very fertile compared with the materials we see in the rest of the state mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, I think that is it for questions. This has been so interesting. I've learned so much. And uh, thank you very much for staying up relatively late to give us this talk over in East Tennessee. <laughs> and, uh, okay, well, no, you're welcome. I've, I've, I've enjoyed it and uh, hopefully it's been a benefit. And uh, um, if you've got any questions, please feel to um, free to contact me. And I didn't leave my email contact, but if you Google Forbes Walker, University of Tennessee there's only one of me that will pop up in the Google search <laughs> and uh, there there may be I'm often in, in West Tennessee if you want you know we can easily uh, talk to some of you guys we can I'm happy to uh, uh, you know see what we can do to assist because uh, you know, we're all part of the problem we're all part of the solution all right well this has been it's been a really hopeful talk I've, I've very much enjoyed it um, yeah, I a lot of material to cover. So some of these slides, these one slides, I could spend, I could talk from it on for an hour. But, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, this is just great. It was just exactly what um, I hoped it would be. Thank you so much, Dr. Walter, Walker, and have okay. a wonderful evening, everybody. Well, thank you very much. You too. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.